Senator Bovey, Senator Patterson, thank you very much for uh, speaking with us. This is a huge report and there's a lot in it, but if we had to narrow it down to a few recommendations with regards to the North, um, Senator Patterson, let's start with the recommendation for a Northern Minister. Why is that important? We, the theme of the report is that the North has been neglected. There's huge opportunities. It's over almost half of the country and we, we have been neglected by the Government of Canada. One of the ways to empower Northern people to get, make decisions for themselves is to have a focus from the federal government in one minister. And that's where the Northern Affairs Ministry recommendation comes in. It's right now an option for the Prime Minister under current uh, legislation. We think the Northern Affairs Minister should be high profile and should be dedicated to take advantage of all these great opportunities in the North and needs. Senator Bovey, what would that, what, what, what would that change? What, give us some examples of what you saw in terms of neglect or things falling through the cracks. Well, we can talk about housing, we can talk about education, we can talk about support for northern artists, we can talk about health, all aspects of daily living. Uh, the game, I shouldn't say the game, the, the, the standards are different. And my question is, is that fair? And uh, we also came up with the line, we heard it many times, that decisions for the North need to be made in the North and by the North. And uh, it is my hope that um, Minister for the North will indeed embrace that and be able to focus direction on the multitude of issues, urgent and longer term that may not be quite so urgent, but will be a pathway. To be a devil's advocate for people in the South, they say, well, we thought we gave devolution to the Northern Territories. We thought that was all done. We thought these powers were transferred. Um, how do you react to that? There are legions of officials in Ottawa. We see them all the time in committees who don't know anything about the North, who've probably hardly ever been to the North, who are designing programs, delivering programs remotely. This is a, a colonialism. It has to end. Let me just tell you a story, if I may. When we were going up to Cambridge Bay, we were told that the once a year delivery of non-perishable goods would happen before we got there. There was the crisis of the cruise ship, there was a crisis of a sailing vessel, the icebreakers had to go off with them. So the delivery boat, everybody had ordered what they needed for a whole year, never got there because of the changing ice. Now something's, something's wrong, right? And you be the person who's ordering non-perishables for a whole year for your community, and then it doesn't get in because there isn't the mechanism to get it there? Concrete recommendation. You ask for a Northern Infrastructure Bank. A lot of people at the press conference said, well, don't we have a Canada Infrastructure Bank? That one has barely coughed up any money yet in terms of projects. Why are you proposing that, and what makes you think that would work? It's, it's pretty very clear to anyone who's visited the North that we are lagging severely behind the rest of Canada in basic infrastructure that's taken for granted everywhere else. Roads, uh, ports, uh, proper airstrips, and workable broadband. So how do we get Canada to realize that it should have a priority in the remote regions, which have great potential to contribute to Canadian GDP. The, the Arctic Infrastructure Bank is a concept intended to focus a priority, for the first time, many Northerners would say, on Northern infrastructure. We have, we're, we're not trying to compete with the Canadian Infrastructure Bank. It's, what we're, it's the, our way of saying, let's make the North a priority in infrastructure for the first time in Canada. Uh, you talk about giving uh, Indigenous peoples in the North uh, a, a say. We know that this is a government that's been preaching reconciliation and working towards reconciliation. Uh, how, would, how would that look? What more can be done? Well, I think understanding the needs of the North and moving on, on those issues. Let's get people in, in proper housing. Let's get people with, with proper broadband so the kids can get their education and take their place as senior in senior positions, so it's, it's creating that uh, fair playing field. Um, 
Senator Patterson, I have to ask you, the Premier of the Northwest Territories has just signed a letter saying that Bill C-69 is going to stifle development. So the Environmental Assessment Act is going to stifle development if it goes through, uh, as is, uh, in the North. Uh, and he's being quite vocal about this. And yet there's others saying, well, that's all about protecting the environment in the North and giving Indigenous peoples a say in the assessment process. How do you react to that? Well, Premier McLeod has been very vocal about not having been consulted about the Arctic oil and gas uh, exploration and development moratorium that was arbitrarily implemented by the current Prime Minister. Uh, he issued a red alert and it resulted in Northern Affairs Minister um, Dominique LeBlanc setting up a consultation process with the Government of Northwest Territories and the Inuvialuit to develop a co-management regime in the Arctic. So Premier McLeod has been strident, but he's been listened to. I think we should be very careful to note that what the Premiers recommended to the Prime Minister in their letter was that there is more balance now in C69, the new regulatory framework, as a result of over 100, well over 100 amendments the Senate introduced. And they're saying to the Prime Minister, the bill is better, we need you to accept these amendments, and we have more confidence that this will lead to uh, a positive investment climate in the, in, the, in the north. What about when one of the critiques, we know that the federal government is not going to accept a lot of the recommendations, and one of the things that the federal government is saying now as we speak is that one of the recommendations from the Senate was to make consultation with indigenous peoples only optional. Uh, there could be almost an opting out of consultation with Indigenous peoples. Uh, the federal government says that's just a non-starter. Well, there, there's a um, chapter on uh, Indigenous uh, consultation in Bill C-69. Uh, factors like um, traditional knowledge and um, Indigenous participation in assessment panels, guaranteed representation on assessment panels, uh, I think are very strong recommendations. It's interesting, we have 12 Indigenous Senators in the Senate now. Uh, there weren't many calls for improvements to the Indigenous provisions in C69. I think uh, most people feel, most Indigenous people feel this is progress. Okay, last question to you, Senator Bovey. You're a relatively new senator compared to your veteran senator <laughs> chair here. Um, <laughs> are you optimistic? Uh, this is your first major study that you participated in, in. A lot of people say these wonderful studies just sort of gather dust on the... Are you optimistic you'll see some action? I'm very optimistic, and I'm going to say yesterday, the Foreign Affairs and International Trade Committee released its cultural diplomacy report, and I urge people to take a look at these two together, because I think there's some very, very interesting synergies between both of them. And uh, both were big, both are important, and I think we're all well aware that not everything's going to be implemented immediately, but as I said in my remarks earlier, this is a very important pathway that deals with the now and deals with the future. Okay, well, I want to thank both of you for taking the time. Thank you for your work, and uh, thanks for speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you.